All right, so I have the okay for going, so let's start. Um, so welcome everybody and thank you for coming. Uh, this presentation is going to be about a new architecture we're working on um, around vaults. So of course I'm going to explain a little bit what a vault is in the Bitcoin context as well. Um, this is an architecture we've been working on uh, for now at three different companies. Uh, Chainsmith, which is my consultancy firm, Noya, which is the fund uh, for now paying for this development, and Leonard, who is the company that Antoine works for, uh, who is working on the development and implementation aspect of it. Um, and hopefully this, like, this architecture will be convincing enough so we can have other industry players to join us. Um, we already started some discussions with big and small funds and some of the hardware uh, wallet manufacturers, uh, crypto banks and stuff like that because they are the typical you know, beneficiaries of, of such a, um, an architecture. Uh, this is not really the type of vault you would use as a normal person. Uh, this is more like aimed towards businesses or multi-party groups. Um, so what's a vault in the Bitcoin context? Um, typically, you might have heard of like cold storage and what a hot wallet is. Um, when we talk about vault, we're trying to go further than that. So instead of having just a cold storage where you have keys somewhere in your backyard uh, buried very deep and you never touch them, uh, and then you have your hot wallet, which is basically your phone or whatever, um, your laptop, uh, where you can spend your day-to-day -day transactions but you just have a little amount in there, um, I mean, this is cool and it can work, but the problem is that sometimes you have to access your cold storage. Um, and what happened at this time then? Do you have like perfect personal OPSEC and you are sure that your cold storage is perfectly secure? Um, so that's kind of the you know, weird thing. And when you're an institution, you can't really go and bury your keys somewhere because you need one guy to know where to find them. Um, so the, the Vault idea is trying to, let's say, put some restriction on how you can spend the Bitcoin transaction. Um, so there are some kind of like, not completely offline wallets, they are wallets, but you cannot, even if you have the keys, you're not supposed to be able to spend the money to whoever. So they are like an intermediary step, you have to have an intermediary step um, to spend from them. I will show different ideas behind vaults uh, through different uh, time. And so yeah, the idea is to deter theft. It's not only to be secure in case of attack, it's also to be so annoying that the attack wouldn't happen in the first place. And this is very, very, very important when you're talking about a lot of money. Because no matter how much security you have, you will at some point be attacked, somebody will try. So now we need to put as much deterrent to make this attack very unlikely to succeed, just to reduce the risk of attack in the first place. Um, and this is the idea behind vaults. Because otherwise, you know, if it's just a cold storage, it's pretty easy to go to your place, threaten your family, and I tell you, hey, tell me where you're cold storage is buried in your garden, uh, or tell me the password of your Duris wallet uh, or your actual wallet on your ledger or whatever. So when you're dealing with a lot of money, you have to think about you know, further than just nobody online can access my keys because it's an offline wallet. This is not enough in real life situation. <coughs> um, it's not new, sorry about the crop from the screen there. Um, it's not a new idea, so there have been a lot of different proposals, some of them serious, some of them less serious. I didn't list them all there, there are like a lot of them. Um, the main idea that we're going to discuss probably is around um, covenants and other restrictions. So what a covenant is, or the idea of a covenant is to restrict the output of a transaction. Um, instead of just restricting it, and I will show you that later, to like a public key, you can also restrict where it can go to. So you can restrict the output of the transaction spending from this output. Um, the idea came from like very long time ago. I think the first time it was used by was by uh, Maxwell on the Bitcoin Talk forum um, in 2013. Uh, it was not very serious as a proposal because he posted like a list of flaws that was much bigger than the actual solution. Um, but it's still there. Um, so different type of how you can put a hash in there and verify then when you're spending that the template of the transaction is corresponding to the hash or things like that. Um, the first I, very serious proposal I have seen, at least I remember, is the uh, Bitcoin Covenant uh, proposal, which was presented at Scaling Bitcoin in Milan in 2016. Um, so I don't know if any of you were there, um, but that was like a weird time in Bitcoin. So it was still the time where 
So Scaling Bitcoin is one of the big technical conference on Bitcoin. Um, and it was created uh, because of the scaling debate um, that you might have heard of because of SegWit and everything in Bitcoin Cash now and whatever. But um, at the beginning, there was debates around how we should you know, help Bitcoin scale. Uh, and there were very technical debates and very serious debates. Um, and so there was a series of conference that still exists today called Scaling Bitcoin that was put in place discussing how we can scale this. Um, and so at uh, Scaling Bitcoin in Milan, um, the team who presented, well, Emin was the one, uh, Emin Terrer presented there. He was the one presenting. He proposed this as two things. First, a cool vault and covenant uh, solution. So how we can, you know, make sure that even somebody with access to this vault cannot do whatever, the, whatever they want with it. Um, but also, he tried to use it as some kind of a scaling solution for a different Bitcoin fork called Bitcoin NG. Yeah, uh, whatever. But anyway, his proposal couldn't work with uh, what was announced because you needed some new opcodes. Um, and as you will see for the presentation today, we're trying to fix the problems with what we have today. Um, as you might know, Bitcoin is limited. Uh, you cannot do everything you want with it, or at least it's not simple to do um, very complex logic on Bitcoin. Um, so most of the proposal, especially around a new way of working out the logic of outputs, is to add a new opcode. Uh, we don't want to do that because we know it takes years to add a new upcode. And when we have businesses uh, with real problems coming to us, we can't just tell them, oh, here is an architecture, but we need a new upcode and the upcode will maybe be reviewed in the next five years and maybe be merged. Um, so you will see, you know, we can't do a perfect solution with what we have today, but we can go quite far. Um, the main one that you might have heard of is the, the Bitcoin Vaults from Brian, Brian Bishop. Uh, it was published last year, uh, I think six months ago, something like that. Um, it's a really cool design. Um, he sent it to the mailing list, the Bitcoin mailing list. And uh, this is targeted mainly for personal use. Uh, so I will explain in detail how his proposal works and how it cannot work for multi-party situations. Um, but if you are interested personally to have like a very, very deep, secure vault system, you can look at their proposal from Brian Bishop. It's really interesting. Uh, and then there are many other proposals that I'm not covering here. Uh, some of them are pretty old. Um, and the main recurring theme that was used um, to try to make it you know, easy to adapt to Bitcoin today um, is to actually restrict the amount of money you can spend from the vault. So, Imagine in the cold storage situation, you would be only able to spend maximum, let's say, 10% of your cold storage per year, something like that. These kind of ideas have been worked on for a very long time. As far as I know, nobody really implemented it. Um, but that's already some kind of an interesting solution if you have a lot of holdings and you think you don't need them at any, you know, you don't need every, one, every single Bitcoin you have at any point in time, but you might want to spread it over time. Um, so this idea has been, you know, propose a lot of times. Um, you all said that you understand how Bitcoin works, but very quickly I'm going through UTXOs because it's important to know that in Bitcoin we don't have accounts. And if you believe we have accounts, well, you need to unlearn, unlearn that. Uh, we cannot have logic on an account with all your money in Bitcoin. Um, Bitcoin is just different UTXOs. UTXOs are like the coins you have in your pocket or the banknotes you have in your pocket. They are not related to each other, but they are in the same wallet. Um, and so when we do logic on Bitcoin, we have to do the logic on each of these coins. Uh, we can't do the logic on the whole wallet. Uh, and this is quite important for the following. Probably in your demo, uh, people will understand that, you know, the time of receiving these funds also impacts how we can spend them and things like that. So in Bitcoin, you have UTXOs. Let's say this is a UTXO I got. It's one Bitcoin. Uh, if I want to spend it, I do a transaction and the transaction is consuming inputs, so existing UTXOs, and it's creating new UTXOs. And the difference between the two is the transaction fee. So for example, in this case, I'm spending 0.6 to somebody I want to pay, I'm gonna get 0.3 as change, and I'm paying 0.1 as transaction fee. Very basic, but this is how it works. That's a Bitcoin transaction, that's what we publish to the blockchain. Um, then you can also, of course, continue that. Uh, one. UTXOs can have, not as many as you want, but can have a lot of outputs after, like in a transaction. And you can also have the opposite, meaning one single transaction spending 
multiple inputs to create one or multiple outputs, right? So that's how it works. We have this state in Bitcoin, which is just the funds that are available to be spent, that have not been spent yet. And when we do transaction, we consume those and we create new ones. Um, and they work with a locking script. The locking script is basically the locking condition. So how can you spend this money? Uh, these coins are not in your pocket, in your wallet. They're not on your computer, in your wallet. They're actually on the blockchain. Uh, what you have in your wallet is how you can spend these coins. So anybody can craft a transaction with whatever UTXOs you want. You just won't be able to sign it. But you can you know, take Satoshi's coin and craft your own transaction in Bitcoin Core. You can do that, and then when you have to sign it, it won't work because you don't have the keys. So a locking script looks like that. So this one, for example, the basic one would be checking that the signature I provide when I'm spending correspond to the public key of me, Kevin. Um, it is cool, but this is what is limited in Bitcoin, actually. This is where, you know, people were like, oh, we can't do everything we want. We have to create Ethereum. Um, so in Bitcoin, what you can do is this. You can put some locking condition about who can spend it. So it can be people, it can be a group of people. Uh, you have some locking condition around time. But what you cannot do is how these funds can be spent in the future. So you, can, you cannot have conditions around these funds that I sent you. You can only spend them to buy video games from the Xbox store. You cannot do that on Bitcoin on chain. Um, yeah, so that's basically the main thing. You cannot, you cannot say where you want the funds to be able to be spent. And you cannot say how. How meaning, you know, how much, time of the day, things like that. Uh, and I'm saying at least for now, because there is a few proposals right now uh, being discussed for Bitcoin, and some of them might be able to correct this. Uh, one of them, which is pretty cool, is uh, check template verify, where you provide a hash of a template that you want the spending condition uh, to match. So that could be around the amount or where it's going to. So it's pretty cool. But it's not implemented yet, so I don't know, maybe it's going to be there in two years, maybe in five, maybe never. So we cannot just rely on that to do votes. Um, all right. So today, basically, the lesson to understand is that whoever has the keys can spend the fund, however they want. It's basically impossible to put restriction on how, which is not cool in what we're discussing. Um, the other thing we can do outside of the keys is the time locks, so time condition on how you can spend this money. Uh, we have two types of time locks on Bitcoin. Um, we have the uh, check lock time verify and the check sequence verify. Um, one of them is about saying when as a you know, specific time, um, let's say 1st of January 2021. Um, before that date, you cannot, be, you cannot be spending this output. But after that, you can spend it however you want. So that's the first one, when you specify a date or an exact uh, block height. The second one is about a relative time lock on when the UTXO was created, so when the transaction was mined. The transaction creating the one you want to spend was mined. Um, and so this is in blocks all time as well. So you can say, you know, two hours. Uh, so in the two hours after this transaction is mined, nobody can spend it. But after that, whoever has the keys can spend them. Um, what I want to make as a point here is that Bitcoin doesn't have a single mempool. Uh, so the mempool is where the transaction not mined yet are right now. Um, but every node has one. They are not synchronized as such. So there is no such thing as a single mempool. So that means that we cannot do something like a time lock saying, from the time I broadcast my transaction, I need to wait six blocks before it's mined. This is not possible. And this is a bit annoying because that would be a really cool way of having a way to revert transactions. For example, if you do a mistake, or to have somebody else, like a watchtower in Lightning or whatever, to revert this transaction if there is an attack. Um, but this is impossible. We cannot do time of signature and we cannot do time of broadcast because of this mempool problem. We don't have any idea of what the time is. We don't have any idea of what the other people are seeing. We don't know if the transaction was signed just right now when we received it or if we just received it really late compared to the other people. Um, so that's a pretty pain painful point for what we want to do. Um, 
so what type of thing what type of things we would like to have in the vault so as i said you know where the funds could go mm -hmm. uh, what amounts could be spent maybe relative or maybe you know absolute uh, time of the day you could think of business hours when i'm not sleeping and somebody can spend from my vault but if i'm asleep then it's not me so it shouldn't be possible um and then yeah where it could go so that could be the you know your kraken uh, deposit address or whatever uh it could be whichever store you want or you have you are used to spend your money but maybe not to a new address um, so this would look like that in a general term for a vault you would have a vault then the money would go maybe to your hot wallet or whatever pre-approved address and then if you want to send it to a new address you have to sign again with this hot wallet where maybe the amount is lower but you can't do that on chain today too bad um, so this is all like what we want to do in the future, but we can't do that. So how do we build a vault architecture for businesses today? Uh, whoops, what did I do? Cool. Um, so today, what businesses do mostly, uh, and some holders, is multi-signature. So multi-signature is a way to enforce what we would like to enforce on-chain, but we enforce it as logic from the signers. So it's off-chain, it's like servers or people uh, try to enforce these conditions. So an example of them is like the two out of three uh, using a third party. So that's the typical vault today. You can think of BitGo or many other businesses like that. Uh, so you would have two keys. One of them is one that you never use. It's like your cold key, cold storage. You have your hot key. And then when you want to spend a transaction, your third party, let's say BitGo or whoever service provider you are using, will check if the time of the day is right, if the amount is right, if the destination address is right, all of these things, right? Problem is they can cheat because it's just, you know, a server deciding that, but any employee there could have the key and just make it move through. Although they, they only have one key, so they would still need to have your key. But anyway, as a cost of attack, it's not that high. Also, why do they use two out of three? It's because you can't trust them to exist as a business and you can't trust them to you know, keep your key forever. What if they disappear? What if they lose your key? Would your funds be lost? That would be bad. So they need to give you a second key again, which means that now you are a single point of failure. Any thief could come and attack your company, your fund, and know that you have two keys, the hot key and the cold key. And they don't need the BitGo or whoever uh, third party key because as design, they don't want to be a single point of failure, the third party. Which means that now you have two keys, so you can be your own point of failure. So any motivated attacker could just threaten you until you give them the two keys you have, including the cold key. Um, you could do in-house multisig, so with different stakeholders in your company, for example, not using a third party. Maybe it's cool, maybe not. You have different types of collusion attack that could be possible. Uh, and then you have some hybrid, which use uh, already an opcode that we will see again later, the CSV which is the relative time load we covered earlier. Um, so how that works is that if you want to spend funds, you have to go through the third party. So your cold storage key doesn't really exist, right? So you have to go through the third party, but in case the third party disappear, after a long period of time, the funds become unlocked with only one signature, which is yours. So if they disappear like 90 days or whatever, uh, then you can spend your funds. Problem is, that would be cool if we could know from when they disappeared, but we can't do that with Bitcoin. So it depends on when was the last time you had funds sent to your wallet. And if you don't use your wallet every, if it's 90 days, if you don't use your wallet in every 90 days, it just means that it's useless to use such a service because you can already spend it without them because you expired the relative time lock. So all of these are like, what is used today um, by businesses? I don't know any stronger thing being in, in use anywhere. Maybe there is, but as far as I know, there isn't. Um, so we want to use vaults as a deterrent, um, as I said. And that means that, okay, it means a few things, but it means that in our logic here, we prefer to assume that the funds are better being locked or lost than stolen. So this is a very big assumption. You, as the victim would still lose your funds in the end if you know, a successful attack appears. Um, but what we're changing is that now we want to know that the thief cannot go away with the funds. So we assume that it's always better if the victim can decide to burn the coins 
instead of giving it away to the thief. So the thief leaves with nothing. Uh, that is a deterrent. I'm not saying you should do that when you are actually under threat, but I'm saying that having the option to do that is already a pretty big deterrent when you have a motivated attacker that has to go through a lot of steps, steps to attack you and might, in the end of the day, just have nothing. Um, also, another thing that is interesting in Bitcoin and we don't have in any wallet right now is a, well, we don't have in any wallet. That's not really true, but we don't have any proper way of doing it in any wallet is a revocation time. So what we can do today is called RBF. So you can replace a transaction by paying a higher fee. Um, but this transaction, let's say if you wanted to pay for inclusion in the next block, you don't have any idea of how long this window of cancellation is because this block might be mined right now and then you're too late. So you can, you can add you know, some uh, uh, OPCSV logic into a Bitcoin transaction so you have maybe one block, maybe two blocks to revert it. Um, this can be used for different things. Typical double, double spending, but um, for example, what Lightning does uh, against attackers trying to force close the channel um, is enforcing that this cannot be done before having enough time for the other person to defend themselves. So this revocation is really important in any type of security design today. And I put this uh, nice cloud, we were talking about clouds uh, earlier, but anyway, it's because that's the magic happening, talking about magic, and that's pretty much what we're trying to crack. Um, now I can go quickly through the proposal from Brian Bishop because it's really cool, but this one is for you know single party users. So let's say you as a, as a holder, if you really want to go through implementing your own logic in your own wallet, because right now it's not implemented anywhere. Um, I simplified it because there were attacks found against the first proposal, so I had to correct them. Um, and that makes it even and even more complex. So I'm not going through the most complex one, I'm just going through the main idea of it. So first, and that's before you even re receive funds, and that's important because that's not going to be the case for us. So in Brian's idea, you already assume you know how much money you're gonna get. So the assumption is that you already have your funds that you want to secure, you know how much you have, but before creating the vault, so you know you want to put all of these funds in the, in the vault. So before you create this vault, you already created the transaction to spend from the vault, which is going to be an unvault transaction as we call it later, or a delay spend transaction as Brian called it. Um, so you sign a transaction from the key necessary to spend from the vault. Sign this transaction, sending it to your hot wallet, so another wallet you control. And then you delete this private key. You make sure this private key doesn't exist anymore. And this is super smart, because if the key doesn't exist anymore, nobody can steal from your vault. They have to now move it to the hot wallet and then steal your hot wallet. Because nobody has the keys, not even you, to spend from the vault. Problem is you have to keep this transaction, this pre-signed transaction, very safe, because if you lose it, well, your funds are gone. You cannot even sign for it, right? This transaction is signed. It's not broadcast to the network. And at this time, the funds are not even in the vault yet. Because by design, you need to make sure the vault is secure, so you need to make sure you already deleted the private key to spend from it before you put the funds in it. And you can do that with SegWit, because we don't have malleability anymore. So you can already know what the TX ID of the transaction will be if you can craft it without broadcasting it. So you know already the amounts, the inputs you're using. So you know exactly your TX ID before it's uh, mined by the network, before it's even broadcast. So you can already spend from it at least crafting a transaction that spins from it. You don't broadcast it. So that's the first step. Um, then you also pre-sign a revolting transaction. So that's a transaction that if you think something is dodgy happening with like somebody moving, pu publishing this transaction and sending it to the hot wallet, um, and it's not you, then you're like, no, 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 that's not good. So I want to be able to put it back in a vault. Problem is, Right now, if you send it back to a vault, this vault is not protected because you also need to have pre-signed the spending transaction from this vault and the revocation transaction from this vault. So this is a recursive thing um, and it's quite complex to implement. So you have to derive all of the things uh, as long as you can and usually the last step is burning your funds. Um, Anyways, and when all of that is done, you can now put all your money, like the exact amount you decided, because otherwise the TXID would change, uh, you can now fund your vault transaction. 
Um, so the problem he's solving is that there is no key to steal, and that's already a pretty good thing. So this is how it looks. Uh, so that's what I explained. I tried to make it clear. Probably that is not helping. But this is how it works. So before you fund this, you need to already pre-sign the delay spend transaction. The delay spend transaction, when the funds are sent, so when they are moving, uh, you have two um, conditions in the output, or at least, yeah, uh, you have different conditions. Either you have a long time uh, before it's spendable from your hot wallet to go to any external wallet, or in the meantime, you can revolt it to another vault that you would also have done the presiding thing and the same thing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so Brian does it for about like 100 derivation, and the 100th time it's burning the funds. Um, I don't know if I covered the attack against it. It's pretty cool. No. Maybe we'll cover it later. Um, the problem is you cannot prove that you deleted a key. You can do it if you know you are the only one to have it, and then you know for sure you deleted it or you destroyed the computer, but you cannot prove it to somebody else. So in a multi-party situation where you have different co-founders or whatever, you cannot say, you know, I deleted my key, just trust me, I don't have it anymore. And then as soon as you have funds in it, oh, you spend it, and you're like, haha, I still have the key. Um, so problem there. And that's really what we're trying to fix. Um, all right, and we already covered quickly the different types of uh, security institutions are using with multisig. Uh, they are cool because they protect against online threat. Uh, typically, you wouldn't have all your keys on the same computer, otherwise that makes no sense to use multisig. So even if your you know, computer or whatever is broken into, it's fine, there are other keys securing the funds. So you are safe against online threat. You are also safe against a single key leak, but you're not safe against two if it's a two out of three, right? Um, and that is not good if you are talking about 10 million, 100 million, whatever, right? It's probably safe for a few hundred or a few thousand euros. Um, and that's what today is used by these guys, uh, exchanges, funds, crypto banks, um, that's the level of security we are at. Uh, it's pretty scary, and to me it's actually absolutely insane that we haven't heard of any at-scale attack against a big exchange trying to break this, because I'm, it's not too complicated. Um, from an online attack, of course, you can't, right? But if somebody was really motivated, like crime organization, they could do it. Um, so now let's go through what we are trying to design, or what we have designed so far. Um, we have a threat model which is covering that everybody is somehow corrupt or compromised except one person. Because if you wanted everybody to be corrupt, then nobody can spend the funds, which is kind of a problem. So we have to go to N minus one. N is the number of participants in a fund uh, for this presentation. Um, and yes, also, interestingly, in the multi-party thing, you have the problem of proving. As we said earlier, I cannot prove I deleted my key, but I, I also cannot prove it's not me signing. You know, Maybe somebody stole my private key, maybe there was a malware on my computer, but maybe it's me attacking. There is no way. If somebody gets your key, there is no way to recognize if it's you signing or not you signing. So you can say whatever you want. Maybe you were a victim, maybe you are the attacker but nobody else can believe you. You have to assume that from a threat model that it's already too late. If the funds are gone, you're never gonna figure out uh, how they are gone. So we need to defend against employee being corrupt, uh, somebody threatening your employees, computer being hacked, or whatever. They're all the same in the end of the day. The key has leaked. And now the big list, uh, which is because if it's just N minus one, well, it's great, just do a multisig. Um, but that's not enough for us. So there are a few things here. Uh, some of them are specific to this exact um, vault we are presenting, but of course they are modifiable, right, for different situations and different potential clients. Um, so in this presentation, we have four stakeholders. So let's say the four people at the management of the fund. Two of them are also traders. So they are the people doing the day-to-day -day operations. Um, why that? Because we do not wants, of course, that everybody is there to sign every single transaction. Although that might be cool for a big cold storage, it's not realistic in any of the use today. 
Um, if you are a big exchange, you're not going to require to have the board signing every single transaction spending from the cold storage. You have to have some people with more power than others to actually do these things on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, it's their job. So the level of security is different between some of the participants uh, in our architecture. Doesn't mean they can cheat. So we have two of these people out of the four that are the traders. Um, we also have a business continu continuity option when one of these two people is unavailable. So in that case, another one out of the four can come in and replace the person. Let's say he's sick or whatever. Um, we want to have the consent transaction that we explained quickly before. Uh, around if you do a mistake, maybe you have some time to recover it, or if you see something weird happening, you have some time to put it back in the vault. So this is necessary in our, uh, in our design. Um, I don't know if I cover it here, no. It's one hour, well, six blocks in our implementation today. Just so if you see the Opsius v6 blocks, uh, that's for that, that's the console transaction. Um, this we're not covering today. But as I said earlier, UTXOs are separate, they're not related to each other. So you could imagine that if you have one deposit of you know, 100,000 euro, maybe the security you need in terms of time locks is lower than if you receive a single deposit of 10 million. So of course, this type of things can be implemented in a wallet. Um, we have another layer again, which is called the emergency deep vault. Um, mm -hmm. This one is absolutely not related to the architecture. It's keys generated outside that we have no idea how they are controlled. You can put other restrictions on top. It could be just a multi-sig, could be an insanely long time lock of a few years, whatever you want. Uh, but this is like the last resort thing. It's a way to move all funds from our architecture to a place where nobody can touch them, or at least it's very, very, very hard to touch them. Um, so that's really you know, never to be used unless there is an actual threat being suspected. So if you really think you haven't seen one of your co-founders, funds are starting to move in a weird way, don't use the consent transaction, just move everything to the emergency and you'll figure it out through the legal way or whatever. Um, and also, um, as a business thing, it's important that if every stakeholder agree, um, you want to let them do their business. If everybody is okay doing the thing, then they should be able doing the thing. So we have a bypass of all our restrictions if all of them are okay to do something. All right, any questions so far or are we okay? <laughs> I'm saying a lot of things, maybe I lost a few people. All good, cool. Well, if you have any questions, just interrupt me. Uh, you're welcome to do so. Um, two things that can be seen as attacks against what I quickly explained so far, uh, but they are actually a feature, not a bug. But they can be used as attacks. Um, one of them is because it's n minus one, a single participant could decide, I'm not signing. And doing so means that from a security perspective, maybe it's the right person, maybe it's the only last not corrupted person, maybe the other three you know, are actually doing something wrong. So the architecture, if we want to respect the N minus one, the architecture should say, we're not moving the funds, which is what it does. So that also means that one single person can prevent any movement of the funds. And then they can do some different threats, like ransom, you know, I'm locking the funds forever. I cannot steal them, but I'm locking them forever unless you pay me a million, right? That is a ransom type attack. We consider it okay because in our case, the stakeholders are all known. So if somebody starts doing that, we know who it is and there are legal ways around that, especially in the business situation. The very bad thing that could happen is one of them doing the same thing, but not being able to sign. So they actually delete their keys and then the forms are locked. Um, this is bad. <laughs> it is bad, but it is okay um, because the way we're doing it uh, the amount of funds that can be locked that way is actually pretty small. Um, you will see why, but we have a pre-signing of transactions, so we would notice as soon as somebody stop pre-signing, and so at that moment we know something is wrong, so we stop the deposits coming in as well. So the amount of money that could be lost forever is just the subset of transactions that arrived since the last time we signed, which could be once a day or multiple times a day. So we're just losing half a day of business, maybe one day, you know, something like that. 
So no recourse for now. Uh, it is easy to implement a recourse, but doing so lower the security of the vault. So you know it's up to people to decide that. And this is how it looks like. I'm letting you some time to see that, and then I'm going through it. Um, but this is what the architecture looks like. And the change is actually the green thing. It's not the thing in there. I don't know why that. I just have a question. Yes. So you said that uh, in case of uh, no activity, you log permanently in the fund in the vault. Yes. Yeah. So, so there is no possibility to log uh, this fund. If it's just inactivity, as soon as the activity comes back, mm -hmm. it's good. Okay. So the way to lose it permanently is to delete one of the keys. Uh-huh. But actually there's no one vault. There are multiple vaults. Each time you receive money there is a new vault, so everything sure. can because Bitcoin is a network. Yeah, so every vault is a UTXO basically. Yes. Yeah. Uh, how do you control the deposit? Because you've mentioned before you stop the deposit. Okay, yeah, that's a business thing to figure out. So deposits would, in the fund perspective, would be withdrawal from online exchanges or things like that. Okay, yeah. but you couldn't actually stop people sending Bitcoin to the wall. Like if I know the address, no. No. you lose a you can't, you can't burn an address or something like that. Like yeah. You can't make an address invalid. Uh, so and that would never be the case. Yeah. Would you actually not like share the address publicly with other people sending bonds and funds there? You could if you want, but there is no way to enforce it. And there would be no way to enforce it because that would be censorship and we'll be breaking one of the main thing of Bitcoin. No, 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 no but I, I mean, if you're running an exchange yep. and you want to actually give one of those addresses as a yep. deposit for your customers, then you lose the key, and then you go to your website or your platform and you change the address, but maybe they have it like saved somewhere and they just automatically resend to it, which yep. is not that is good, but like No, for sure, that is something we could consider. Um, no, no, no. Seeing okay. such an attack though, is not supposed to be something you see every day. So yes, I'm not sure it makes sense like to implement. It's a mistake where like some right. of your clients have somehow cached a deposit address and just reuse it, assuming how it worked last time, it's going to work all this right. time. Reuse is fine. They would still, like, they would need to delete their private keys. So it's, it's like, it's not something simple. And they are supposed to have a backup of this, right? So key management is not covered actually in this presentation, but I can share with you a document afterwards. Uh, key management is, of course, critical for that. Mm -hmm. So each person should, of course, have a backup of their own key, right? Because mm -hmm. if their computer is stolen or whatever, you don't want the lock mm -hmm. to happen, right? Yes, and also in case of death. Because, uh, in case of death, it's, it's a bit different, yes. This yeah. is a legal problem. Yes. Because the, here, we only speak about the technique. I know. But there is also a lot of legal problem with uh, notary banks, sure. etc., cetera, to uh, unlock the key. Yeah. Mm. Uh, actually, uh, the first question uh, is interesting and uh, related to an, an ongoing que question we had, which is how many derivations of the BIP32 are we doing? So, if we uh, if we create a new address each time we want to uh, receive funds, that's better for that's better for the company, but it's it increases the burden of rescanning the whole chain and. Since uh, all these transactions on the right, and especially the emergency transaction, has to be signed each time we receive funds in the vault, if one of the wallets has uh, a very old BIF32 derivation, it, it wouldn't send the emergency transactions, hence the funds could, could be left. But they are, let's say, uh, millions? Estimated of uh, possible addresses for the der 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 derivation path. We use uh, non hardened derivations, so that's 2 exposant 32, 31, so that's uh, 2 billion. Yeah, approximately. it's quite big. Yeah, it's quite big, but uh, I'm not talking about the limits, but I'm talking about which addresses each wallet should wa actively be watching. When, uh, to send the signatures of the emergency transactions. Because yeah. we could go for the whole tree, but that would be you know, impossible for the hardware we have today, pretty much. Or at least very, very slow, so not usable for a business perspective. Um, all right, so let's go through that. So yeah, as Antoine said, um, we have a vault per UTXO. 
Uh, so every time money is received, it's a different vault. Even if it's an address reuse or whatever, uh, technically it's a different UTXO. Addresses are, doesn't, that don't really exist on Bitcoin. Um, so these vaults um, are locked by a four out of four multisig. So we need the four stakeholders to be able to spend money from a vault. Um, but from one of the requirements we had, um, we don't want to have the four of them online every time we need to do a business operation because that's annoying. So to allow the two traders to be able to spend from the vault, then we have to pre-sign a transaction. Uh, a little bit like Brian did in his uh, proposal, but what Brian does is pre-signing all the spending before even funding the vaults. We don't know what amount is going to enter the vault. So we do that after. So you can, sp you can send money to one of the vaults, which is easy to you know, derive with, a, with Bit32. You can, you can create an address. Any of the full participants could create a new vault address, uh, just deriving the, uh, with the other copy of the other participants. Then we are pre-signing, but actually we're pre-signing three transactions, four transactions. We are pre-signing, and we start with the emergency because that's the last resort one. So if something really go bad, that's the most important one. So the first, um, so what happens? Okay, we receive a deposit. So all the four um, stakeholders receive an alert or whatever on their wallet at some point when they open it saying, hey, you have a new incoming deposit. You're supposed to now do the pre-signing process so the funds are actually spendable by the business. And this pre-signing process is first pre-signing this emergency transaction, which is sending to the cold keys that we have nothing to do, or at least the vault system has nothing to do with. That could be, you know, four out of four multisig with different keys that have never been used, never put online, but it could be as crazy as you want. This needs to be like the most annoying thing to spend from. Uh, again, we should keep in mind that locking funds is better than allowing a theft. So this should not be lower security than the rest. It should be higher security than the rest. Um, once we have done the emergency TXs, because we have two of them, um, we can know already the TX ID of this, even if it's not done yet, signed yet, um, because SegWit, which is great. So we know the TX ID of that, so we can already do the same emergency transaction spending from this unvolting transaction, and we can also do the concept transaction, which is the one sending back to the vault. So in the case of SegWit transaction, you convert to an emergency transaction to return the No, uh, SegWit lets you know the transaction ID of a transaction that hasn't been mined or even signed yet. Yeah, even sign. No, just sign. sign. Yeah, that's okay. sign. So this is this is really cool. So you can oh. create a long path and start signing by the end. So you, you can actually unfold your protections are in place before the funds are into this thing. Didn't you say at the start that you don't support SegWit? No, we do only support SegWit, actually. Oh, I'm sorry. Maybe I did I, it. I missed it. All right. No, no, this is the, this is the big thing. If without SegWit, we can't do this. And version two transactions. All right, so the yeah, difference between emergency and cancel is cancel is like in case a mistake or if you're not sure if something is wrong, is wrong, you're just sending it back to one of the vaults. So this thing is pretty easy to go through it, right? Uh, this is never to be used unless something really bad happens because this is really annoying to spend from. So this is fine, you, know, you can even do a mistake in your transaction, you can cancel it. Um, and then you sign this one, that's the last of the four you are pre-signing. That's the unvolting transaction, um, or what Brian called the delay spend transaction. Um, the unvolting has a script that lets, well, that has two conditions. So either a four out of four, so the four stakeholders all agree we can spend from that, send it wherever we want. Well, in that case, we don't care because they already have the same four four in there, so they could spend directly from there to the external address. But what it lets us do is to sign these uh, emergency TX and the concern TX with the same key. So that's why we have this four out of four. Uh, the other way of spending from this is um, doing a two out of two uh, with the two traders and a two out of three because now we have the redundancy in case one of the trader is sick or whatever. Uh, two out of three plus a co-signing server that, do you want to cover that later or now? Oh uh, yeah, I cover that, but you can talk about it, I see. All right. I'll do it later. Um, plus a time lock. The time lock is to 
so when this one will be mined, uh, we want six blocks before it can be spent from using the low amount of signature, or instantly if you have the four out of four. So you can always, like in the next six blocks, you can always push the cancel or emergency to uh, block these funds. Um, yes, so then you have just your transaction to spend it wherever you want. Uh, and the change should, of course, go back to a vault, depending on how big it is, because this is part of the important thing in this uh, architecture. Um, what is my next slide? Do I cover the, yes, okay. I don't need to cover the server here because I'm covering it here. A lot of text. So this is the process. Uh, that's basically what I described, um, but in a clearer way. So first you receive a deposit. So again, this is different from the proposal uh, that Brian has because we don't need to know how much money is going to enter the vault before its creation. Um, what happens is that the funds, when they arrive, are technically locked unless we have the four signatures uh, to spend from it. So in a normal business situation, the two traders are not able to spend from a vault. First of all, it needs to be pre-signed by the four stakeholders. Not at the same time, it can be an asynchronous process. We just need the four signatures before it's available to be spent from the two, stakeholders, uh, the two traders. Uh, what that means is that funds need to be acknowledged before being spendable. That's what it means. So if, no, if one of the, uh, the stakeholders hasn't seen the fund arriving, these funds cannot be spent by any of the traders. So deposit arrives, uh, stakeholders get a notification on their wallet saying, hey, uh, you got a new transaction coming in, please sign them. So it needs to start actually by the end, emergency first, then cancel, then unvolting. Yes? Is that the uh, watching part that I was talking about with addresses? If you have too many derivations and you, you don't watch addresses, you can't go false. Yeah, it's because you need to know that funds have been received, first of all. Um, so once the four have been pre-signed, then it becomes spendable because we have the unvolting transaction pre-signed and the traders can now publish it and spend from it, right? So the two traders, um, let's consider just the two for now. So the two traders sign a spend transaction to move from this uh, unvolting thing that has been pre-signed. Then it goes to the co-signing server we haven't covered yet. Um, with today's Bitcoin, we, oops, with today's Bitcoin, we cannot make sure that uh, the two traders are only signing one version of the transaction. So they could double spend themselves after the expiration of, um, of the of CSV. So after six blocks, so when their first transaction they have signed is now mineable, they could also double spend themselves, meaning move the money from maybe a legit, um, receive address from, I don't know, Kraken to their own pockets. Um, so they could do that, you know, using RBF. Of course, we could disable RBF, but in that case, they can still do it at minor level. Um, so there is still an attack possible. So to avoid this attack of the traders being able to double spend themselves after expiration of uh, the of CSV, we have a co-signing server that will only sign the transaction once. Um, but the co-signing server does something else which is verifying that the unvolting transaction has not been uh, mined before it's signing the spend transaction. Does anybody know why? Can you repeat the question? Yes. <laughs> this step. The cosigning server is not going to sign a spend transaction if the parent transaction, the unvolting transaction, has already been mined. What is pointless? To do it because if it's been mined, the funds will be removed. No? They might. So yeah, the op CSV, so the delay we enforce, is from the time the parent was mined, yes. So if it was already mined, let's say, six blocks ago, then the transaction could spend the funds straight away without letting the cancellation window or the emergency window um, to the other participants. So what we are faking here is like enforcing so it's not what we're doing, right? We can't enforce that on-chain. We are trying to emulate that we had an opcode or whatever that let us enforce a 
um, a delay from the time of signing the transaction. So we want that after this transaction is signed, six blocks need to go through before it's mined. So to do that, we're just making sure the parent is not mined at the time of signing. So then you have to push the parent and uh, the child together so you have your six block window to uh, cancel your transaction or trigger an emergency. Um, so that's why, by default, if the server sees that the unvolting transaction has been pushed, something dodgy is happening, so just revolt it, just in case. Uh, second thing, yeah, it, the server is making sure it's not signing the same, or the, is not signing a, a spending transaction from the same a UTXO twice, because that could be an attack that the traders are only showing a legit transaction, but then at the time where they can, it can be mined, they're actually pushing the one stealing the funds, and we don't want that. Um, so, same thing. Um, yeah, so the server is only signing once. Great. Uh, then it needs to broadcast both. It needs to sign the unvolting transaction and the spend transaction. Today with Bitcoin, that is a non-standard transaction. So, it doesn't work. It wouldn't be broadcast. The spend transaction wouldn't be broadcast. So we are broadcasting it through other means uh, than the blockchain. So we are going to send it to Watchtower that you might cover later. Um, so the stakeholders, the four people in the funds receive a notification. SpendTX is broadcast. You basically now have six blocks to cancel it if you want to. So if there is a problem, they can broadcast a cancel TX. And if they don't, after six blocks, it's mined and the funds are moving. And on top of that, at any of the steps connected with these arrows, uh, a emergency transaction can be triggered to move all the funds in the super safe uh, thing. So that is like pretty much every single step. So that is supposed to be quite secure. Um, anyways, maybe, maybe there is a flow, but as far as I know, this is, this is pretty good. All right. That is done for me. Yeah. <coughs> just, just one question. Um, if, I'm, uh, if I have this kind of solution on some uh, administration come to me and say, okay, you are scam, you don't have all the funds you pretend to have, uh, is there a way to, uh, to prove, to, to, to generate a proof of fund? Yeah, if you have the public keys of all the other stakeholders, you can reconstruct the pay to script hash, and then you can show that you have signatures for the pub key that it's part of the pay to script hash. For all the vaults? Yeah, for all the vaults, but you need always to reconstruct pay, pay to script hashes or pay to witness script hashes. You need to have the pub keys of all the other stakeholders. Yeah, there is a there is a bit to prove that you own the private key of an address, or at least you you are able to spend from an address without you know, giving out any more information. So that could prove that the funds are actually spendable without you know, having to reveal the, the, uh, the spend. How did you go? Uh, no, I'm just, I was okay. just commenting. Okay, so uh, I'm, uh, my name is Antoine for Daosia and the internet. I've been hired by Chessmith for making a demo uh, implementations of the, arch of the architectures. So I talk about the demo, the, some trade-offs, and some improvements that are slightly possible. I, uh, I'm not as fluent as kid in English, so don't hesitate to cut me if I need to repeat. Uh, so the demo implementations is currently a work in progress. Um, so it's available at, at GitHub under the name Voltaic because uh, voltage was, was taken. So <laughs> yeah, it's it's in Python and it's very very documented in order for it to be to be implemented by other developers or by me or by anyone. So the focus has been put more on the, the understanding of the inner working more than on the security of the implementation since it's just a demo. Um, the trade-offs uh, were to derive new addresses for uh, to receive funds. We use non-unhardened derivations. So that's kind of a possible flow. 
But when, because uh, as you may know, uh, another derivation pass may allow someone with the chain code and the, the XPub and one of the private keys of, uh, of a child to derive the private keys of, of the child, of the derivation. So, but after talking about it with Kevin and Pierre, they argued that anyway, if someone can take the four public keys for the four of four, you're, you're always anyway screwed, so you can, you can use uh, an addons. Um, so there is a cosigning server as a single point of failure because we, re we rely on the cosigning server for giving the, the transactions to all the watchtowers of each stakeholders and we will rely on it for keeping the traders honest. So if the cosigner, so the cosigning server is compromised, the traders can self double spend. Uh, so uh, some things that we talked about I think that we might implement is that since we need the watchtowers of every, ch every stakeholders to get the transaction anyway, let's get them to sign the transaction. So since that's, that's a bit uh, did bytes in the outputs and that's some weight units I did, but since it's discounted, it's witness, it's witness data that's not a big cost for for the user. Um, another thing is that since we use BIP32, we need synchrony. We need the, all the stakeholders to be synchronized uh, for the derivation. Uh, for example, if there are four stakeholders and one of the stakeholders is always requested new addresses, he bumps his derivations each time but the other stakeholders may not know that he generated new addresses and then they could not know that uh, some phones were received and then they couldn't sign the emergency transaction. Um, so the, that's a, for the big gap between the efficient indexes. And another thing was when those stakeholders exchange signatures for when receiving food. So from, uh, I thought for the demos, so maybe the wallet should talk to each other. Hey, uh, uh, I saw I, I got new funds, here's the signatures for the emergency transactions. But then you're going to re-implement peer-to-peer protocols with all the trade of uh, peer-to-peer protocols. If one wallet goes offline and has only sent the signatures once, all the stakeholders don't have all the signatures for all the transactions, so, so that's a bit of a... Uh, Flow. So we went for uh, signature servers. We introduced another server, we will, which will store signatures for all the transactions by transaction IDs. So doesn't have any private keys. So not that much of a, of a single point of failure, but it can provide uh, the signatures at any times. So stakeholders don't have to do some ceremonial things to generate the next emergency public keys since they can't know the transaction ID of the funding transactions and we don't have Sigash no input or Sigash any provider so we can't do anything for this. So and this server this previously introduced server could also give the uh, the maximum index, current index. So each day uh, what is called pull the server for the maximum index of other stakeholders. So they are always in sync, uh, in sync, or not that much out of sync, so they can each know when the difference points. Uh, we can think of everything the involved, the transactions spending the, the involved transactions. So you remember when you spend from the vault, you create an involving transaction, and before creating that involving transactions, you sign the cancel transactions to the vault and the emergency transactions back to the, to the deep vault. But what if there is a mempool spike in six blocks? And you, uh, you've calculated the fee, the fee rate of the transactions at the time you, all the stakeholders were signing. And then there is a, a mempool fee spike and the transaction never gets confirmed, confirmed bef before the six blocks. 
So we could just just use RBF, but we are we are also using uh, multi C. So RBFing is hard because the sequence that we want to bump to use RBF is part of the signatures. So we have to re resign all the transactions and make it resigned by all of our stakeholders. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's what I talked about. That's to make the watch tower side. Okay, so that's it for my part too. So if you have any question, yes. Are you working on Ethereum? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a joke. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> <laughs> okay, so no question? Uh, just yeah. For the idea of the replace by fee, you, you want to have a different uh, transaction with uh, one for in case of emergency, uh, I speak of, of fee, or uh, just uh, I didn't thought about it that much because I started the, the demo implementation one week ago, so, um, but I think we could pre-sign a whole set of okay. uh, transactions with differ different modes. Uh, dif yes, and uh, actually kind of the way a core implements Fiorate estimations, like uh, we can sign it for five blocks, can sign it in an economical mode, can sign it in a conservative mode for two blocks, so the fear rate is very high. Yeah, th that's possible to patch. And also the <coughs> yeah, it's really for the unvaulting, not the um, concept transaction. Uh, unvaulting is important because you cannot spend the funds if the unvaulting transaction is not mined. So it's important maybe to be able to bump this one. The most important one to be able to be bumped is the console transaction because that would be bad if you know there is a problem and you cannot, you know, send it back to a vault. The emergency transaction is not that much of a problem because we can already, you know, bump the fee really, really high because it's never supposed to be used anyway. So it's fine if we're spending you know, 10,000 sets, 20,000 sets in a transaction that is never going to be transacted normally unless there is a big problem. And if there is a big problem, I mean, probably we're happy to pay a million set or whatever, yeah. even more than that. So we can already have the emergency t TX as like insanely high fee. Uh, and then the concert transaction somewhere in between, you know, high enough because it's not supposed to be used every day, but maybe not something that could be used to just burn funds or whatever in a, in a weird way. And if I want to monitor all the vaults of a company, I will search for all the vaults with the same amount? You wouldn't normally yeah. be able to yeah. see that. But we, we won't show the expert because uh, yeah. we use non ardent derivation. Uh, I have a question for Antoine. Yeah. yeah. So I see that you have uh, initiated a project at yeah. the start of the world. Yeah. yeah. Uh, how long have you been designing this project? Uh, actually, I didn't design the, the architecture. Kevin designed the whole architecture. Then I backshed, I backshed some things, uh, the checks it checks it verify. But the, the hard work of the architecture is from Kevin. And I started the implementations once we, were, we agreed on the proposal. And how long did it take? To implement it? It's no, to design uh, uh, the architecture. And to yeah, so it's not, it's not, let's say it's not starting from scratch entirely because um, like I was already pretty much up to date with the different vault architectures, but it is from scratch in terms of being a multi-party vault architecture. Like I've never ever thought about that before. So when did we start that? Like maybe mid-December, something like that. Um, then having the first draft by the end of December, uh, starting to go through different type of uh, reviews uh, back and forth with different people doing the reviews so it's not me doing everything um, I push the main ideas and then finding holes and holes and holes and more holes because the beginning you didn't have cosign servers and then you're like hey you can double spend yourself all right and then you know the fees and then you know a lot of things uh, you keep finding holes in this kind of stuff 
So the hardest work is probably keeping re-re-reading the same paper over and over again. Um, I think so far it's four or five people who did a complete review of the paper and each of them keep finding different stuff. Um, so you have to, you know, improve the paper every time. And uh, it, I don't think it's finished and I don't think it's perfect, even as an architecture, right? So not even talking about the implementation because that also will need review because you don't use anything in production, especially at this level, without having proper review of everything, including libraries and all the other things you use. Um, but yeah, we probably need much more time and effort to go through that. Uh, people testing it, people trying it, people trying to break it, because you don't, you know, you don't go live with something in one month, or at least not with crazy amounts. So yeah, I think that's the answer. So probably a month and a half for something yeah. pretty final, like it is today, but it's never final. Some code to show or something? Uh, <laughs> do uh, do, do you want to use uh, someday a uh, mini script? Uh, Actually, uh, mini script. Yeah, we tried. Yeah. Mini script okay. were used for all of the scripts except the important one um, the unvaulting transactions. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, I can show the script actually. Uh, short question in a while. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Are you planning to develop an uh, MVP? Uh, what? You develop what? A demo. A demo, yeah, yeah, actually. With uh, front end and everything. Uh, yeah, uh, I, was thinking, I was thinking about a CLI, but um, maybe I can put up a GUI. GUI. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it was. Uh, I think the demo is what was mainly to explore the concepts, to show that it was possible, so the test pass is possible, and to re implement it correctly, but I think it's m pretty much a waste of time to make a GUI on top of a demo because it's not usable anyway and shouldn't be, actually, must. All right, so Miniscript, um, Miniscript were used, was used for most of the things, and at some point uh, we reached a, well, th at this point, um, we reached a point where Miniscript doesn't work for what we want to do, um, because in the logic, at least I didn't find any way, so in Miniscript, the way you describe things um, for it to output the script, you have to describe the logic of it, and you have to make sure, or at least Miniscript doesn't handle if you write multiple times the same uh, public key in there. So if you put, if, if in your logic you say, for example, Antoine and Kevin need to sign, or Antoine and Kevin and Pierre and Leah need to sign, then Miniscript is gonna consider that the two Kevin and the two Antoine are different keys. So the script is gonna pull is gonna be insanely big. Um, so you have to do your own, you know, work <laughs> to make sure you factor everything and you manage to have only one key, uh, one public key for each person in your description. So that is doable. The problem is that when we had to add, so that's the, you might have heard that we want to have a possibility of spending if um, one of the two trader is unavailable. So adding the third trader was the thing that you know, was further than what I could do in terms of factorization. So I had no idea on how to do it. So this script was done by hand. And there is actually a mistake in this one. Yeah, check seek verify. Uh, this one is a verify. Yeah, check seek verify. And it went through four reviewers without being seen. <laughs> and then Antoine was like, oh, it doesn't work. <laughs> All right. Uh, so yeah, this is done by hand. Don't do that. But Miniscript doesn't handle that. Or at least I don't know how to write this in Miniscript. Oh, and yeah, because it's fun. Um, so I'm trying to optimize how the script execute in terms of cost uh, on the blockchain. And so 
it's not necessarily the easiest thing to read. So what we want to do is basically two out of three uh, between the two trader and the extra guy plus a delay of six blocks or a four out of four. <coughs> Doesn't look like it, does it? Because we don't want to rewrite twice the same public key because otherwise you pay for the data you have on the blockchain. So you would pay for the public key twice and that's annoying, too much money. Um, so we factored all the keys and there is only one, uh, so that's trader one is a pub key, trader two is a pub key, C is a pub key and D is a pub key. Uh, and they only use once. So the way we're doing that is that instead of doing the check multisig operation, um, we are actually counting the number of valid signatures. So we're doing just math uh, on the script. So that's why you have the up add and up swap. So if this is valid, that's a one. So we move the one, and we get the signature of the second one. If it's also valid, then we add them, that's two. And then we swap again and we verify if there is three. If the three are valid or not, you know, you change your logic. Um, and that's how you do it. And in the end, you, you know, you do your magic. So that's how you do the, the multisig uh, in, in, in script in an optimized way when you don't want to use uh, check multisig. But put a verify in there, yeah. Beers, we can do beers, yeah. and uh, you can probably try the, the demo or whatever uh, around beers. All good? Yeah.